Wow, thanks for showing up here. Um, I'd like to present to you um, a project. It came out after doing many one-off projects. So in a way, it's like an attempt to, to make the ultimate framework. But first, let, let's, uh, let's have a look what people in DIY audio are doing. Um, when you look around here, when people do audio, they um, make analog circuits or they modify existing circuits called circuit bending, like you have to speak and spell, they modify it and to different things, or they uh, make uh, MIDI controllers as an extension of their laptop to have a new way to control it. I saw a really nice one, a wooden MIDI, MIDI controller yesterday around here. Um, uh, and then there is uh, people doing sound with 8-bit microcontrollers, I mean, like going like a sort of hybrid uh, topology, making like digital pulses with, from software and using the pulses as um, sound. Um, and then there is emb real embedded digital signal processing. Um, that means you're not dealing with just pulses, but accurate measurements and Time, time domain uh, processing in a digital world that could create just any waveform, uh, not limited to, to um, square waves or uh, chip tunes. Um, there's very few um, digital single processing DIY happening um, because it needs quite a setup. Um, this is what digital signal processing is about. So you have sound input, you convert it from analog, from a continuous waveform to digital numbers at certain at regular time intervals. And then you have a processor which runs some sort of software. Um, can be controlled from MIDI or from a front panel with knobs and dials. And then at some point it can go back to uh, analog sound um, a computer can do this actually very well. Um, there's lots of software around, open source, closed source, uh, for every taste. Um, it's sort of crowded in this field. So there's software synthesizers that emulate old analog machines or um, new things that were impossible to recreate, to create with analog machines. It's very crowded. Apparently, if you, if you go to a music instrument store, there's still a lot of dedicated hardware. Uh, people like to play a dedicated instrument because it's uh, plug and play. You just turn it on and it always works. It's not designed to, for office work and it will not show you um, email notifications. It's really quite distracting if you if you jam do a jam session with friends and you work with a laptop. There's often something that sort of pops up, pop ups and or you you updated something and you start like testing things rather than playing. Uh, so I designed some hardware and that is exactly this like analog to digital converter. Uh, and digital to analog and a processor. So you see um, like uh, stereo input, stereo output, a headphone jack, a USB port for computer connection, a slot for an SD card, and uh, MIDI input, MIDI output. Um, it's like, it's very similar as what is inside the, the things you can buy in a music instrument store. Um, because if you would take these things apart, you would see that the inside is sort of similar. Um, it's just, they make a lot of products differentiated by the shape, the number of knobs, and the color of the plastic. And the firmware running on it. Um, and I, I didn't do the, the knobs and the, the plastic, 
Uh, so there, there's front side connectors, and then on the back end, there is like general purpose inputs and outputs that allow you to connect almost anything. A bit similar like uh, Arduino. Um, it's, not, it's really not limited to, to knobs and dials. You can also do servo motors or accelerometers or um, light sensors, whatever you can think of. It's more like circuit bending as a, as a, as a goal than as an afterthought or as a mod. Um, so to get this thing talking, we need to develop some digital single processing firmware that uh, breaks apart sort of in an audio input output driver, um, a media input output driver, other input outputs for front panel knobs and dials. And then you make any combination of um, digital single processing algorithms like oscillators, filters, envelopes. And then you have to map the parameters to control it somehow and some bookkeeping to load new presets or things. Um, it's not the first time that um, open source embedded ESP solutions have been developed. Um, but they didn't really reach critical mass. Um, I think um, programming DSP can be sort of complex. There is math mathematics involved. For example, you have to make trade-offs between execution speed and quality. For instance, the, the, um, the standard uh, C math library is for of sort of limited use. It's made for mathematical precision, and sometimes you really want to go much faster than that. Um, it's not because you could edit or add DSP algorithms to, to firmware that someone will do so. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm going to make a little switch to what's, what's out there in software, um, in pure software without going to hardware. Uh, there is uh, several data flow oriented programming languages. Um, the open source, the main open source one is pure data. Um, so there's a program where you can put, you select objects, you put them on you, on the screen, you configure them, and you you um, put wires between inputs and outputs, and you can and this turns into a program. And your document is a program, so it's a sort of programming language. Um, there's a commercial um, friend called Max. And they have a similar syntax and um, grammar. The nice thing about um, graphical programming is that you don't need to, you can't make errors against uh, syntax or grammar um, because you're, you choose your objects. You don't have to really type code. So it's, um, you, you can only make errors against the logic. So, the, the punishment of making an error is, is much smaller. You don't get a compiler saying like, I, I don't understand it. It will just do something. And it's up to you to make it do the right thing. Um, so with this low punishment of, of um, experiments, it's very accessible to artists and, and uh, musicians and uh, so, Around both languages, there is quite a field of, quite a community of, of artists um, developing all sorts of things. Um, it's a graphical programming language. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a complete graphic, it's not a complete programming language. I wouldn't implement a quick sort in any of these by patching things around. That, that really gets awkward. But uh, single processing is really about regular data at regular intervals, and the, the execution part of the code is really boring. It's really linear. Um, 
both environments depend on uh, ob objects are, are loaded as dynamic uh, dy dynamic loaded libraries. So at runtime, it needs to dispatch function calls from to DLLs, which implies a huge overhead if an object just needs to add two inputs together. It's, so it needs to, the processor needs to make an indirect jump, save the context, add, and then restore the context. While this probably would ha could have been one instruction on, on in, in um, optimal code. <clears throat> so uh, let's try to make editing firmware s similarly as easy as possible. Um, so uh, I wanted to make a graphical data flow programming environment for firmware that does not expose um, command line tools, does not expose C++ code, unless you would want to, and ease in the compile, upload, and run cycle. So and that was the first version of the sort of the architecture. So on your computer, you would run a, a program, the Axolotl patcher. This one has like a library of objects you could put on the screen, wire them up, and that, that software would generate code, compile it, and upload it. And then this is the Axolotl core, that's the that's the board. Um, yeah, we, we have to the camera at the wrong place. Could someone put the camera over here? Um, <clears throat> so after uploading, you have the Axolotl core program to the right firmware. You can do sound IO, MIDI IO, and general purpose IO. And after flashing, you just turn it on and you can play. Um, I'll give a little demo of that. Um, just so it is the patcher environment. So um, this uh, empty document, and I, with a double click, I get the object library. I have like a linear catalog, an alphabetic catalog of objects. We also have like a hierarchy of categories, which makes it easier to search. You can also start typing a name and will like find the best match. Um, so I start with, uh, as an example, with the uh, SAL tooth wave. So this selects a SAL tooth wave oscillator. SAL tooth wave is like a linear ramp, re periodically repeated. So let's have a look at the anatomy of this object. It has like an input on the left. The blue color is a, is a data type. This means it's for modulation, control voltage. Like it's for, for slow changes, not suitable for um, audio quality, but good enough for changes over time. And then there is a um, red data type, an output on the right. Um, both have indication, plus minus means that they're like bipolar. Um, and then there's a dial where you can adjust the frequency. Um, I try to make it user, as user-friendly as possible. So at the zero position, it would give a certain value in hertz. Musicians want to read the note, the name of the note. That's, that's one click away, and you also get the factor compared to the middle value. So if I would uh, if I would put the dial on at 12, I can just type 12. You see that the ratio is times two. So 12 semitones in music corresponds with a double frequency. And at the same time, you can also wonder if with uh, that seven um, semitones corresponds with a almost one and a half, which almost directly shows the, how harmony works in music. Um, so to listen to the oscillator, I have to add a, I, I, t I take a volume control just for, to be safe with the, with the sound system. 
Well, I have a multiply object here, multiply with a constant, so there's a dial to adjust a constant, but I created a blue object, I mean blue input, blue output. But similar like you have like uh, function overloading in C++, this object will upgrade to a red one because it sees, oh, you, you give me a red input and there is a red um, implementation of this object as well. And then I can uh, wire that to the uh, output audio out stereo uh, dial it up. So the first version was this, you press a button and it will generate C++ code and it would be uploaded to the target and if everything works, can you, can you turn the volume up a bit? Are you, oh, 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 I unplugged something. Um, turn it down first please, the external input. <laughs> okay. So here you see um, uh, that you already get a working system. Um, I'm actually jumping in my presentation. Um, because version one was just, you, you make a chart with your program and it would run that. Um, version two was about making the changes interactive. So after um, generating C++ code, compiling it, doing the upload, um, make it also instrumented that you can change uh, parameters on the fly. So that you don't need to go to a recompile and um, re-upload cycle for just adjusting a, a number. Um, And and it also goes the other way around. So you see two level meters here that will also read back from from the code and show you the actual volume level. So no computation, no no critical audio computation is going on on my laptop. It's the firmware that is compiled and uploaded that is talking with the with the user interface um, after it's running. Um, so, okay, we have a little oscillator and uh, um, if, you, if I can turn this very easily into a, a music keyboard. If I take a keyboard object, and the keyboard object has an output for the note that's being played. And, and there's a gate output that will indicate when a key is pressed or not. It's very similar in, in um, reasoning as a, as a old, or, well, they still, they still are made uh, analog synthesizers, analog, analog model synthesizers. You have like machines where you have like, a, it's a bit similar to this, but every every object is like, a circuit, and you interconnect them with patch cables. Um, to grow up to a playable thing, I have to modify the volume depending on the gate. The yellow cable type is a boolean on or off, but that also can convert into a blue one. There doesn't need to be a substitution object that has, that has um, a yellow input because there's a conversion rule from yellow to blue. So I turn that on and I take a virtual keyboard. Oh, volume is still at zero. And <laughs> voila. So we have a playable system. I thought five objects would be a bare minimum to get a playable system, but um, it can grow quite a bit. Um, let's uh, go into 
I dig a little organ patch. Uh, organ, organ, organ. Okay, uh, so. Um, there's like a sort of a. Um, so one of the problems if you want to play music, you don't you don't want to be limited to one key, because well so, some instruments do for some instruments it's reasonable, for, but for an organ it's not reasonable. Uh, but if you want to express that in a in a patch, it's sort of awkward. If you would have to wire up twelve or sixteen different uh, oscillators and parts for if you want to play different keys. Um, so I made um, a way to use one document as an object into another one. So actually this object comes from this patch. This, this document has like magic objects. It's called an outlet object that represents uh, an output on the generated object that corresponds with it. Uh, also here there's a little the red output and and inside it just uses a keyboard object like I showed in, in the beginning. Um, so that, that's the, the child patch. And then on top I ask, yeah, give me 12 voices of that and just arrange it. Uh, but I also wanted to show that inside this object some parameters um, have like an attribute, it's called parameter on parent. So the, the parameters with this flag set, they are promoted to the object corresponding with the inside object. Um, so that's 12 voices of a certain architecture to play one um, organ pipe or something. Um, so and then uh, uh, I can change the inside parameters. So the rest is just a matter of combining elements and adding objects to the library um, up to... Uh, currently, I think there's over 400 objects serving different purposes. And it seems to be that's like the, the critical minimum. The critical minimum has sort of been reached that you can start doing stuff without having to write a, another object for a, a certain purpose. Um, let me show you something that, um, if you're used to Arduino or things, um, that might give it a different look. What I did on this setup is um, wire a potentiometer to an analog input, so it's just a regular voltage divider. Um, so, yeah. Uh, like this, so it takes power supply, ground, and uh, fits that into the, the potentiometer and gets back the analog input. So instead of, in an Arduino, people learn to write like a function call called analog read. Um, in my own environment, it's called GPIO in slash analog. And I select, select the channel where it is connected to. And in, Ar in Arduino, people learn how to, to print numbers to a console and read the numbers that fly over there. Here I can have a, a little chart plotter or um, 
uh, a dial or um, <coughs> or a numerical readout. No, it's already in the dial. Don't need that. So I turn the knob. You see, um, it's instrumented. You can. You don't have to f watch the flying numbers. You can. Just, you have like the oscilloscope on on screen. Um, so. I think that's more. Uh, that's quite a bit more learnable than than writing the same thing in C and then getting a terminal with numbers flying by. Um, in the same world, you can also do PWM to drive a stepper motor or dim uh, dim LEDs or um, do SPI or I square C. Mm -hmm. I'll, as a, as a final demo, I take a bit of, well, I'm, I'm not a really, I'm not really a musician, uh, although I, I sometimes enjoy playing something. Uh, so. So uh, on top there is like a little. Um, this is a metronome, a square wave generated at one at five hertz. That means um, 340 BPM, and it's divided in steps. So it's not really 340 BPM. Um, mm -mm. And then like a counter that counts to 16. If the counter does a carry, it, there's another counter that will count to four. Um, when that does a carry, also something else will happen. And, and then there are steps and patterns, and oscillators and generators and stuff. So, um, but I thought I would like make a modification to this uh, document, um, otherwise it's so boring. Um, I take this uh, and, um, GPIO in analog object and I, I have like this little two channel mixer to, to recombine influences. Okay, um, quickly, no, I just, I just skip the analog input just for the time uh, and I press live. Um, so there is like a drum machine and a hi hat and, and a bass line. Um, I can, uh, I can um, these are no samples, no samples involved, it's just all algorithms. That means you have a lot of flexibility. It's a very nice demo. Yeah. So, thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions and answers right now. But if you're interested in Johannes' work, then just come up to him right after the talk and maybe you find a place to meet somewhere. So please give him a applause.